Good morning, everybody. This is Tim Krause again. Hey, I, uh, I, and I, bless your hearts, I love receiving videos from you guys uh, asking me to do some work and clarify some things that are said on the video. I am happy to do it. Today we're dealing with another one of those videos. This is from Donnie Reagan. This is a sermon that he preached on September 22nd, 2021. Uh, and we're going to talk real briefly about uh, something that Donnie said. Uh, the, the title of this video is going to be, Thus Saith the Lord. Did William Branham's Thus Saith the Lord ever fail? So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show the video clip real quick from Donnie. Now, remember, as always, study notes are going to be down in the, uh, in the description. There's a link to those. There's also going to be a link to the entire video so you can see it in context. We'll show a clip of the video or an extract of the video, and then we'll go from there. So uh, just, just give me a minute here, and let's go ahead and see the video or that portion of the video, and then we'll, and then we'll address that. So here's Donnie talking. Thank you. And then he went down item by item by item. Well, I believe this, just like you said. I believe this, like you said. I believe this, like you said. But he come right down to the last little item. And that was the clincher. And he come to that item that he did not believe that Brother Branham could receive the word from God, which had not been written. Well, if you don't believe that, then you don't believe he's the same caliber prophet that Paul was. And you sure don't believe that he was the same caliber prophet that Moses was, or Haggai, or Malachi, or Zephaniah, or Zechariah, or Obadiah, or many of them men, because what they had to say, they could not point back to what any other men had to say. That's why they were God called prophets. Now I'm not that kind of man. No other preacher here tonight in the building or no other preacher alive on the face of the earth can receive the word the way a prophet can. Because a prophet is so designed that he receives that word from God and he gets out of the way in such a way that it is a perfect infallible way by which God projects it to him. Is that right? That's why he can say, thus saith the Lord, and when it is that, it is perfect. It cannot fail because it is, thus saith the Lord. Now I can say what... Okay, so that's Donnie talking about thus saith the Lord, and that if it's thus saith the Lord, it won't fail. We First things first, we want to talk about how Scripture, because we always go back to Scripture, all right? We're, we're going to go back to Scripture... We're going to repeat this again. You've heard it a million times from me, but we're going to go back to Scripture. We're going to talk about how a prophet is vindicated in Scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that, what, that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. That's how we know Prophets are vindicated uh, in Scripture. Now, what did Donnie say? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote this because I want to make sure that we get this. He's talking about prophecy, and he's talking about being a prophet. Now, I, I by the way, just to let you know, I am not a prophet. I, I am never, ever claimed to be a prophet. Don't have the gift of prophecy. That's not what I do. And here Donnie talks about the same thing. He says, and I'm quoting Donnie now, now, I'm not that kind of man. No other preacher here tonight in the building or no other preacher alive on the face of the earth can receive the word the way a prophet can. Because a prophet is so designed that he receives that word from God and he gets out of the way in such a way that it is perfect, infallible way by which God projects it to him. Is that right? That's why he can say, thus saith the Lord. And when it is that... It's perfect. It cannot fail because it's thus saith the Lord. All right, that's that's what Donnie talks about. So even William Branham, by the way, ta talked about being a prophet, told us that he was infallible. I'm going to go through these quotes a couple of times. William Branham told us that he was infallible. Here we see uh, it written in the in the exposition of the seven church ages, chapter nine, the Laodicean church age. Uh, and it goes through, but I deny upon the infallible evidence of the word that there is more than one major 
prophet, messenger, who will reveal the mysteries as contained in the word, and who has the ministry to turn the hearts of the children to the Father. Thus saith the Lord, by his unfailing word stands, and shall stand and be vindicated. There is one prophet, messenger, to this age. On the basis of human behavior alone, anyone knows that there are where there are many people, there is even divided opinion on lesser points of a major doctrine, which they shall all hold together. Who then will have the power of infallibility, which is to be restored in this last age? For this last age is going to go back to the manifesting the pure word bride. That means we will have the word grace once or the word once again, as it was perfectly given and perfectly understood in the days of Paul. I will tell you who will have it. It will be a prophet as thoroughly vindicated, or even more thoroughly vindicated, than was any prophet in all the ages from Enoch to this day, because this man will of necessity have the capstone prophetic ministry, and God will show him forth. He won't need to speak for himself. God will speak for him by the voice of the sign, Amen. Now, William Branham talks about that. William Branham declared himself a prophet over 400 times in over 1,100 servants throughout his ministry. This is one time he said it in 1965. This is April the 29th in evening service, the choosing of a bride. He says, I'm going to say this for my first time over the pulpit. He'd actually already said it many times before, but that's my parenthetical statement. I've stretched out farther tonight on this than I have on anything else any time, anyhow, before the public, because I've had a great freedom in these meetings. If you believe me to be God's prophet, you listen to what I've told you. 400, over 400 times and over 1,100 sermons. Now, William Branham also tells us what we're supposed to do when we come across a false prophet. Here's what William Branham says. And this is in 1962, April the 7th, the signs of his coming, Cleveland, Tennessee. That's a Saturday service. Here was the test of a prophet. If a prophet prophesied, and that what he said come to pass, then hear him. But if it don't come to pass, then God hasn't spoken. That's all. So don't fear him. That's right. If there be one among you who's spiritual or a prophet, I, the Lord God, will make myself known unto him in vision, speak to him in dreams. And if it comes to pass, then I, that's me speaking, sure, God ain't going to lie. You know he can't lie. There's nothing in him to lie. Scripture talks about this as well, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 through 22. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shall not be afraid of him. And in fact, William Branham uses a self-proclaimed proclamation of scriptural authority, thus saith the Lord, 1,616 times in his sermons. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. We could go on and on and on and on and on all day, and I'm not going to read every sermon excerpt for you. I'm going to take some out of the excerpt where William Branham talk specifically about thus saith the Lord. Now, here we had a prophecy that William Branham spoke about the world coming to an end in 1977. Now, most people in the message would say, no, 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 that was only a prediction. So let's take a look at that portion of, of his sermon real quick. And this is where they began, that is, people in the message where they began. Then I seen the United States as one smoldering burnt over place. It will be near the end. Then I got in parentheses, I predict this will take place. Predict. Okay? This will take place. Now, remember, the Lord, that's what the Lord showed. Remember, that's what the Lord showed. But I predict this will take place before 1977. Upon this prediction, I base, because of the onrushing slot that's coming now, how fast that it is moving, how long it'll take till this nation meets its place. 1960, November the 13th, condemnation by representation. But let's take a look at that portion of the quote in context. They start way, way, way too late. Here's the entire quote 
it shall also have been an evil thing done in this country. They permitted women to vote. This is a woman's nation. She'll pollute this nation as Eve did Eden. Now, you see why I'm hammering the way I do. I got thus saith the Lord. Branham declares in this quote, I got thus saith the Lord. That's that, that all of a sudden that becomes not a prediction. When, when Branham says, I got thus saith the Lord, according to William Branham, he is infallible. And nothing that he says is contradicted. I got thus saith the Lord. In her voting, she will elect the wrong person. The Americans will take a great beating at a place that Germany will build, which will be a great wall built of concrete, the Maginot Line. Now, stopping just a moment. The Maginot Line was actually built by the French. They built it after World War I. It was facing towards Germany. And that's when the French built this uh, thing called the Maginot Line. Uh, and you need to know that. That's important for you to get because that's the Maginot Line is not built by the Germans. So right up front, when he's talking about this, you didn't get it exactly correct. It was the Siegfried Line that William Branham was speaking about. The Siegfried Line was the wall that the Germans built out of concrete that was basically facing south, French, Belgium, you know, the, the, and, and the, he, it was facing south. So he got that a little bit wrong. But let's go back. Uh, which will be a great wall built of concrete, the Maginot Line, 11 years before it was built. But finally, they will be victors. Then when these women help elect the wrong person, then I seen a great woman rise up in the United States, well-dressed and beautiful, but cruel in heart. She will either guide or lead this nation to ruination. I got in parentheses, perhaps Catholic priest. Now this is, or Catholic church, this is William Branham speaking. Also science will progress, especially in the mechanical world. Automobiles will continue to get like egg shape. Finally, they will build one that won't need a steering wheel. They've got it now. It will be controlled by some other power. Then I seen the United States as one smoldering burnt over place. It will be near the end. Then I got in parentheses, I predict that this will take place. Now, remember the Lord, that's what the Lord showed, but I predict this will take place before 1977. Upon this prediction, I base because of the onrush slot, blah, blah, blah. He talks, uh, and he finishes that quote. Notice at the beginning of that quote where the message believer doesn't start, they start a little bit later. He says, I got thus saith the Lord. So William Branham did speak that prediction using I got thus saith the Lord. But let's go on to another one, less controversial, clear as day. William Branham spoke of his campaign going to South Africa. He spoke about that campaign 31 times during his ministry, many times using thus saith the Lord. These are just some examples. I'm just picking out some of the instances where he spoke. And and he says, this is William Branham speaking. Then, just then, he taken me out of the spirit. Listen, Brother Jackson, you never heard this. None of the rest have. And he set me down at Durban, South Africa, in that same booth, standing there before those Tens of thousands and thousands of people there. And I looked and I seen, and he goes on to talk about it. And then he speaks at a little bit, a little bit further down. He says, and I heard him scream with a voice that shook me from the vision, said, there'll be 300,000 of them in that meeting. Thus saith the Lord. Mark it in your book. I come out of it. I said, my Lord and my God, thanks be to you. And then he goes down a little bit further and I'm going to have a meeting. I'm going to have a meeting that's going to consist of 300,000 people. Now, that was 1952, July 13th. Uh, that's in Hammond, Indiana, a Sunday service called Early Spiritual Experiences. Here's another instance where Branham talks about the same meeting. And he shows... Uh, and I'll go through it real quickly. And he sat me down in Africa and showed me a greater meeting than there was the first time. A little bit further down, there's 300,000 in the of those in that meeting. Mark that down, for it's thus saith the Lord. His word comes to pass. 1954, do you now believe Phoenix, Arizona? That's March 7th, 1954, evening service. And now we're going to see another instance of that. Uh, mark my word, write it in the pages of your Bible, for it's thus saith the Lord. 
Remember, when we land in India, you're going to hear of tens of thousands times thousands being saved. The Holy Spirit has said it. I've wrote it here in my Bible. It's wrote in tens of thousands of Bibles right here, like the resurrection of the little boy by a vision that he said. There's 300,000 of them in there. You see if that isn't right. That's 1954, May the 15th, Jefferson, Indiana, questions and answers. Here's another instance where he says it. This is the Queen of Sheba, Chicago, Illinois, 1958. This is the 7th of January. Now, he says, but the vision can't fail. It's what God has already said, and it cannot fail. The vision, I've got it wrote down in a flyleaf of my Bible. I'll bring it down maybe and let you see it, how that it really reads that I will go to India first and back to Africa. But he told me to go to Africa first and then to India, knowing that I would fail because the vision can never fail. God has spoke it. Now, but the last time, William Branham speaks about that meetings. This is what he says. And this is in 1965. This is July the 11th of 1965. And I had planned on so hard coming back, burned in my heart. I just returned from Africa, as you all know. And when I got there, I had a restricted visa and wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me preach because it gathers too many together. A little bit further on down in the quote. And then the very last minute, very last minute to go, here was wrote across my visa, cannot anticipate in any kind of religious service, can only come hunting. He goes down a little bit further. The best thing I can do, go find out yourself and you know what trouble, what the trouble was and what the reason of it was. It was because of so many people gathered together. The government wouldn't let me have it. That was in 1965. The sermon was a shame. It was taught in Jeffersonville, Indiana, July the 11th. Now, I want to stop for just a minute. One of the excuses that's often used for this particular vision, and others, by the way, is what I call the Jonah excuse. That is, Jonah, uh, he didn't go to Nineveh just as the Lord had predicted. God actually had to put him in a place where he actually finally went to Nineveh. So, so let's talk about that. You see, it doesn't really matter what the prophet does. God said in Samuel, none of his words will fall to the ground. If he's a prophet of God, none of his words will fall to the ground. When he says, thus saith the Lord, it's thus saith the Lord. His words will not fall to the ground. In the case of Jonah, we find that very, very instructive because Jonah did do everything he could to try to avoid going to Nineveh. He was afraid that if he delivered that that uh, commission of judgment, the king and the other people of Nineveh would kill him. So he went the other direction. But you see, it didn't matter what the prophet did. It didn't matter what the prophet did. It, God placed that commission with Jonah. It was thus saith the Lord. He placed that commission with Jonah. And God brought Jonah back to Nineveh and that commission was accomplished. Didn't matter what Jonah did, didn't matter what anybody else did. God gave that commission to Jonah, thus saith the Lord, and it actually took place. Is that the same instance that took place here? Do you, we think for a moment, if God had really told William Branham, thus saith the Lord, you're going to have a meeting in South Africa and it's going to have 300,000 people, that a a government bureaucrat would have been able to limit God in sending William Branham to South Africa to have a meeting in South Africa with 300,000 people? Of course not. If it's if God had heard that commission, it wouldn't have mattered what William Branham did. It wouldn't have mattered what God did or what anybody else did. God gave that commission to William Branham, thus saith the Lord. That meeting would have occurred. And this has spawned all sorts of speculation within the message. There's an entire denomination of the message called the Return Ministry denomination. They believe William Branham's actually going to come back from the dead, and when he does, he will fulfill that vision. There was an airplane that was parked on a tarmac in Arizona filled with everything he needed for that particular trip, and they knew that William Branham was going to rise from the dead, and they were going to take him on to South Africa where that vision would be fulfilled. They knew that that was going to happen. Hasn't happened. There's no scriptural basis for a prophet having, you know, risen from the dead and have, then having his, his uh, you know, commissions uh, fulfilled. No scriptural basis or authority for that whatsoever. But they base their entire he's going to rise from the dead denomination, 
the return ministry denomination on that fact. It's kind of sad, actually. But keep in mind, by the way, the the uh, Jonah uh, as the Jonah excuse as we go through these and talk about these a little bit. How about the brown bear vision? Now, this is a lot of people have discussions about this. Let's see what William Branham says about this. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of things here. Coming home the other night or the other day or just before I come home, I, I was, I fell into a vision and I seen some little fellows, thin, looked like young boys, hat on caps, and we were standing hunting and I'd shoot a mammoth, big, brown looking bear. And then they turned around and said to me, but there's some some confusion about the meeting. And I said, no matter what the confusion is, if I was supposed to go wherever it was, I'll go anyhow, see? So see, Branham, he is even taking up the position that the that gets rid of the Jonah excuse, but let's go on. It doesn't matter, and the vision stopped. I don't know where that's at, but this is on tape. It's going to happen, see? Just remember, it's going to happen. It's a vision. April the 1st, 1962, the sermon was Wisdom versus Faith. There's another situation that he speaks about the very same thing. Many of you remember the vision I had where I had shot the grizzly bear, nine-foot grizzly bear, and the church remembers me telling it here, and the caribou. Well, I had another. Remember, it's on tape here. I seen a huge brown bear, great huge brown bear that might be a Kodiak, and it wouldn't have worked out that, or, and it wouldn't have worked down there in Canada because they're not there, you see. But wherever it will be, it will be. It will be, that's thus saith the Lord, it will be. See, that was May the 6th. 1962, the sermon was possessing all things. Now here he speaks about it again. Now I'm going back into that country that you might know when I came, come back next year. Next year. Here Branham is being very definitive about when this will take place. Now I'm going back into the country. In, he tells us when and where. Now I'm going back into the country that you might know when I come back next year. I'm going to get a brown bear that's almost twice that size. You see if it's right or not. I've seen it. When he was standing, put my hands on his haunches, laying on the ground like that, and I could put my hands on his hips like that and laying him down. Now you find out if it's right or not. You'll see these little visions around here. No wonder you minister brothers sometimes get suspicious. Well, it might be mental telepathy. It might be psychology. Show me somewhere else it's going on. What happens in these great psychologists, telepathists, they guess. It sometimes happens, sometimes it never, and it's this, that, or the other, but God's perfect and never fails. June 10th, 1962, in the, in the sermon presuming. Here, William Branham tells us what, he tells us where, and he tells us when that'll happen. Now, Ed Biskell, who accompanied William Branham on that on that uh, hunting trip he speaks about this on several he he stated publicly that william branham discussed his disobedience and the resultant failure of the vision that we just spoke about several times william branham spoke about that vision here and ed biskell understands and agrees he was with him on the hunting trip it did not happen it failed but here's we here's ed biskell's explanation and i'm going to Read this. So in these 30, going on 32 years of ministry, I've tried to stay true to the word. I don't know one thing I've ever had to alter on because I just read it out of the Bible, said just what the Bible said and let it go like that. Well, we've had discussions about that. The last video that I did talked about whether he really re misread the Bible or did he make stuff up or did he reverse the Bible? Let's go on with this. And so I haven't had to take back or rearrange because I just said it the way the Bible says it. And I found out if God's spoken anything, we must go with that word in order to make it be fulfilled. In order to make it be fulfilled. Again, he's using the Jonah excuse here. We've seen that, as I told you last night, of a vision just recently, see, that is, that it... I had to be there and warning to be there and telling me six months before to be on that spot and stand there and saying, go down there three times with them. And I just walked on with the other men and the vision passed right through exactly God's part. And I was left standing. So we want to remember, you've got to stay on the word, just right with the word and where the word leads, you go right with the word. Then it'll bring you out. All right. I'm sure 1962 
This is September the 9th. It's a morning service countdown, Jefferson, Indiana. Here's the challenge. William Branham just used the Jonah excuse. He just described a an instance where what he said using thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And again, if God had given him a commission, thus saith the Lord, it would have occurred just like it did with Jonah. Jonah, God got a commission or God gave Jonah a commission and Jonah did everything he could. He he purposefully did everything he could to avoid that commission because he was afraid of what the people in Nineveh might do. And God put him in a position to deliver that commission because it was thus saith the Lord. Here William Branham is giving us a uh, an excuse. He's saying that these things are conditional on what the prophet does. But we know that's not true when we look at the book of Jonah. Here he says, it, it, look, it failed because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Then it wasn't thus saith the Lord. If God would have wanted William Branham and gave William Branham a commission to have meetings in South Africa, he gave it to him, thus saith the Lord. It would have, nobody could have stood in the way of that meeting in South Africa. Certainly no visa complication. And that, you know, again, we've, we've got the return ministry denomination who believes that William Branham's going to come back. And, and frankly, at least they admit to the fact that William Branham's prophecies failed. They did not come to pass. Because they say, but he's going to return from the dead. He's going to be raised from the dead before Christ comes back and all of his visions and prophecies will come to pass. Now, there are some message believers that are of the view that William Branham's ministry was unique, was one of a kind, because of his use of thus saith the Lord. And in this way, we can differ differentiate William Branham from other self-prophets. Let's take a look and see what other self-appointed prophets did. Here's Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. He writes, Doctrine and Covenants. He says, Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph Smith, I am well pleased with your offering and acknowledgments, which you have made for unto this end have I raised you up that I might show forth my wisdom through the weak things of the earth. Here, Joseph Smith claims, Thus saith the Lord, God anointed him a prophet. Here, Mormon historical revision by J. Reuben Clark, former member of the First Presidency of the Latter-day Saints Church. He says, there are those who insist that unless the prophet of the Lord declares, thus saith the Lord, the message may not be taken of revelation. This is a false testing standard. This is what this guy says. And this is in, this is in defense of Joseph Smith as a prophet of God. Here, Ellen G. White, she was the Seventh-day Adventist prophet. In her book, The Great Controversy, page 595, she writes this, Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Ellen White claims that she received, thus saith the Lord, and that you can trust everything she said in her books, everything she said in her sermons, everything she said in her writings, because she also received, thus saith the Lord. Now, here's Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science. This was, and this is a great big long title. Uh, it's, it's in a document called Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Teachers. It's volume 10 of that series. Um, and I'll read a little bit from it. As to the argument that the truths of Christian science have always been known and practiced by a few, Mrs. Eddy issued her direct challenge. In all of her literature, she set out the unqualified statement that she was the discoverer and the founder. She was never apologetic. She assumed no modesty. She did not feel. She spoke as one having authority, as did Moses of old. Thus saith the Lord. So here we have other prophets all through history that basically are going through and telling you, I'm the prophet of God. I'm the Elijah spirit because I have thus saith the Lord. Let's not forget Clarence Larkin, who wrote his books, he talked about, you know, anyway, it, and we know that William Branham stole a lot of his doctrines and Clarence Larkin considered himself the Elijah spirit as well. Here's Charles Russell. He's the Jehovah's Witness prophet. Uh, there, if you look out at the website, the Most Holy Faith website, it's for the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
This is what it, you'll see on their website. Thus saith the Lord, the message delivered by Pastor Russell was not one of his own imagination. It was the truth of God's holy word. Here, let's take a step even further than that. The Branch Davidians have a website called branchdavidian.com. Remember David Koresh? He was the Elijah spirit in the Branch Davidians. Okay, let's take a look and see what the Branch Davidians website has to say. The book of Revelation, having the authority of a thus saith the Lord, states that a man-child, David Koresh, this is there, the, that per parenthetical sentence is theirs, not mine. David Koresh shall be born in the latter days, our day. See Revelation 10.5. The latter day man-child had within his body the same spirit, which is also written within Yeshua's body, the duplicate spirit of Yeshua for the Old Testament period and the spirit of David Koresh, for the New Testament period is the same duplicate spirit of the Archangel Michael. In other words, Yeshua and David Koresh were the angelic, Michael in human form, in the latter days of the man-child's name, David Koresh, and now the chosen vessel's name, typified by Darius, are the only names whereby salvation may be attained. So here we have David Koresh saying, you got to understand David Koresh and his message before you can be saved. Just like William Branham said, you know, the, the blood of of uh, Christ on the cross is dried blood and you need a new blood word just like William Branham said the day spirit of the day of Pentecost is not adequate you need the spirit of our day the Laodicean age the message of the hour William Branham is the messenger so you need William Branham's message in order to be saved here we got David Koresh saying exactly the same thing let's go back and summarize this whole thing and I want to make sure that we're very very clear scripture tells us that uh Prophets are vindicated because God lets none of their words fall to the ground. Here we've given you just a couple, just a couple of the many, many, many examples that we could give you where William Branham said, thus saith the Lord. And where what, what William Branham said is, thus saith the Lord, did not come to pass. So we speak about thus saith the Lord with William Branham that didn't come to pass. He according to scripture, cannot qualify as a prophet of God. We saw as an example, Deuteronomy 18, chapter, chapter 18, verses 20 through 22. If a person speaks in that way, uh, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. William Branham spoke presumptuously. William Branham is not a prophet of God. William Branham is a false prophet. I'll leave it there. We'll pick this up. I appreciate you guys sending me these videos. It gives me an opportunity to do some more research. And, and I really enjoy doing the research and, and uh, doing these videos for you. I'm really grateful for the feedback that I've received. It's very positive feedback. Thank you all for that. Uh, I really appreciate it. Listen, we, we, uh, we just love everybody. We want people who are currently in the message to come out of the message, come out in freedom, come out in the liberty of the salvation of Jesus Christ without the need for a human intercessor. And that's we're motivated to do this because of that. We just love everybody. We just want you all to, to see Jesus Christ as the way forward as Lord and Savior. Listen, if there's anything we can do, let us know. Contact information on the end card. Keep up with the podcasts. They're really, really good. The Believe the Sign Off the Shelf podcast, really, really good. And if you have any other questions, go to the Believe the Sign website. We'll take some time, answer any questions or any comments or any feedback that you have. We appreciate hearing from all of you. Have a great rest of 2021. We're in November now. For the folks in the U.S., have a great Thanksgiving. I guess the folks in Canada, too, have a great Thanksgiving, or maybe they've already had theirs. But we just, we just want to tell everybody, God bless you, and we sure hope you're having a great end of year. We look forward to talking to you again now. Bye-bye.